institutions, including the OECD, and has also uh, published many uh, research papers, and she is also very prolific uh, in um, uh, in having publications with many authors. So I think uh, you are probably a very good collaborator, and it's impressive to see that even having a family, you have been able to do that much. And I am very happy to to have you with us, and uh, I am looking forward for your presentation. So thank you very much, Laura, for having accepted, and uh, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Ima, for a very kind and generous introduction. I should say uh, to Javier's comment to begin with that I would much rather be in Mallorca right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even um, but having said that, um, I, I'm going to talk about industrial policy and green innovation. But to the point about uh, the many collaborators, as many of some of you may know, I have a background in engineering and economics, and I publish in very interdisciplinary journals. So in that sort of field, it's very common to have uh, many co-authors, and I find it very interesting to collaborate. So let me, oops, here we are. So uh, just to begin with, I'm going to be talking about economic recovery, about competitiveness, but I wanted to start with climate because I wanted to bring together the green part of their recovery. And uh, for those of you who are not, who don't spend all your time thinking about uh, climate change, um, you know, I wanted to just start with uh, something that uh, many of you probably already know, which is that current emissions trajectories are not consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement that uh, Ima mentioned. We're not consistent with the two degrees uh, goal or the, of course, the 1.5 aspirational goal. What you can see in this figure is that uh, the International Energy Agency projections are more consistent with something around a three degrees Celsius um, uh, emissions. Um, one important uh, kind of uh, fact to mention is that since 1997, the global carbon intensity, which is the carbon intensity, the carbon emissions per product of GDP, has been declining at about 1% per year. So that's obviously good news. But as you can uh, imagine, given these graphs and the, you know, the trajectory consistent with the 1.5 degrees, the dark blue line at the bottom, this is not enough. And in fact, to get to this aspirational goal of uh, uh, stabilizing global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we would need to increase the rate of uh, decrease um, in the carbon intensity of the economy by over one order of magnitude. So this is just to give a sense of, of magnitude um, of uh, emissions. Um, uh, trajectories. Now, going back to the recovery and the pandemic, uh, again, just to set the scene before we get into um, you know, what one can do about it and what research can tell us about uh, a green recovery, we all know that uh, the world economy, economy has been uh, hurt by the pandemic. Here on the top graph, we have an OECD uh, report from just March 2021 that uh, showed that um, the um, GDP index here in the purple line on the top graph uh, was less than uh, was 10% below the projection that was uh, made uh, last year. And again, the OECD is expects that the world output will reach pre-pandemic levels by mid 2021. So we've had uh, you know a, a, a big hit in the economy. Many of you might have seen the you know the some of the changes in uh, GDP in the economy compared to previous shocks, and it, it was of course very big. Now, what I wanted to emphasize here, which is something I'll come back to later on in the presentation, is that uh, like climate change, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, has hurt uh, the world economy unevenly. So what we have in the bottom graph, it's a figure from the World Bank, um, and here the axis is, uh, is not zero, it starts in 580 million. It basically shows uh, that uh, the World Bank estimates an increase of 88 million people uh, in, um, that have entered extreme poverty as a result of the of the pandemic. So again, there are many metrics one can use. This is just extreme poverty around the world. Um, and again, going back to the point about climate, even though we've had this really big impact in the economy, we saw big changes in transport, in working from home, um, flights, and, uh, and some, some industrial processes, what we see is that Emissions uh, in 2020 were only down by about 6.4% in 2019. That is actually less than expected back uh, around May last year. Some uh, forecasts suggested that it might be 9% less than the previous year. It was actually lower. So the emissions haven't come down 
that much. It was a big drop, but not as much as was expected. So, uh, so what is the, this link between the pandemic recovery and between climate change? There's been, um, over the past 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of research on the political science, public policy, and innovation systems, innovation studies, that suggest the value of a climate change mitigation strategy that emphasizes competitiveness co-benefits. For those, uh, you know, for people in politics or from people in different parts of, of the world, this is not a big surprise, but we now have a very substantial body of evidence uh, you know, the, the first uh, um, body of evidence that I wanted to get to is the research that shows that competitiveness co benefits in the form of new industries, jobs, and, and um, increased exports, for example, shape public support. So, research doing randomized controlled trials on uh, public support for different um, energy policies, things like um, feeding tariffs, renewable portfolio standards, and so forth, show that. Um, that competitiveness can change people's support of policy. Um, of course, this issue of policies that can result in industrial or uh, job co-benefits is particularly relevant uh, right now because of the, the what we just discussed, the economic impacts of the pandemic. So these co-benefits shape public opinion. And at the same time, um, the, these uh, new industries, renewables industries, battery industries, uh, energy efficiency retrofits that can help mitigate climate change also create new players, new winners that can counter the balance of uh, the, the power of the incumbents of those industries that have a stake in the fossil based industry. So we have these new, new actors that can overcome uh, stick institutions, policies and lock in. Again, there's a, a wide uh, literature on this topic. Surprisingly, it emerged mainly after 2005 uh, if you look at the you know, political science uh, literature, looking at the energy and environmental in sector, there, there wasn't very much. So these two things combined suggest that a green industrial policy framing and focus uh, in climate change mitigation uh, can be very effective. So what is this green industrial policy I'm talking about? Well, here I'm going to rely on some of the work of one of my previous colleagues at the Kennedy School, Danny Roderick, that many of you know about. Um, work with um, Tillman Altenberg, um, and um, they they have this very nice uh, report that I'm sure many of you might have seen. Uh, and here they define industrial policy as government actions to, uh, as um, government actions that act alter the structure of an economy, encouraging resources to move into particular sectors that are perceived as desirable. And in that same paper, they also define green industrial policies, so government measures aimed at accelerating in structural transformation towards low-carbon resource-efficient economies uh, to also enable productivity enhancements in the economy. So this is exactly, uh, you know, mirroring some of these definitions that I'm talking, that I mentioned earlier when it comes to the competitiveness co-benefits of climate change mitigation. So GIP, green industrial focus, uh, um, green industrial policy focus and framing can help, at least in the short to medium term, with the politics with innovation, and I'll talk about this and what I mean by innovation in a second, as well as COVID recovery. So where, where are we in this COVID recovery? We talked about the pandemic to begin with. Well, the first phase was the rescue phase about sustaining jobs, and I'm sorry about the typo and businesses. Um, the recovery phase is what could be more or less green. And uh, what I'm going to argue is that we have a lot of evidence that uh, having a recovery um, phase uh, for the post-pandemic um, policies that is more green uh, is beneficial. Again, to give a sense of the magnitude of what we're talking about, uh, in, the, in June 2010, Bloomberg put the total government stimulus at around 12 trillion. So we're not talking about small numbers. Um, and at that time, it was around uh, less than 0.2% uh, targeted towards climate priorities. Again, this is not surprising. This was the rescue phase. This is about keeping people's jobs keeping businesses open. Um, there, there are a lot of discrepancies of our, about the estimates of how big these initial uh, pledges were, in some cases 9 trillion, 15 trillion. These are very big numbers in any case. Um, so um, in this second recovery phase, uh, policies could emphasize the opportunities of green investment, and I'm going to talk about some of these opportunities. Uh, um, but what I will also argue is that, that to realize these um, green opportunities, well-designed policies are essential. 
So what are some useful things to know for climate policies? And you know, when we think about as a, as a central planner from a government, national government perspective, although, although some of these things can also be considered at a local or regional government perspective, well, to decide what policies to put in place, what infrastructure investments to make, what training programs to put in place, what uh, deployment subsidies or, or regulations to create, it's very important to think about the cost of getting green technologies on the ground, the cost of net zero. And uh, what I will um, start with in a second is that these costs of getting green technologies on the ground are crucially dependent on, among other topics, the cost of mitigation technologies, the cost of solar panels, the cost of uh, windows, the cost of low carbon steel, the cost of batteries. And of course, other so costs, and, and again, I will show some of the evidence on this, is that there are transition costs to workers, businesses, and vulnerable communities that are heavily dependent on the, um, uh, on the current uh, economic structure. So we need to know something about the cost. What is it that, what are some of the things that we've done um, that give us more information about this, about the cost of getting green technologies on the ground? And then, of course, the benefits of green industrial policies across various dimensions include new industries, increased competitiveness. I'll talk about this. We have improved health outcomes from reduced air pollution, ecosystem services, natural capital. And on these last two points, I will um, bring to people's attention in case you haven't heard about this, the Dasgupta review, which uh, came out a couple of months ago that talked about the natural capital dimension in uh, uh, national wealth accounting as well as reduced climate damages, improved mental health, more cohesive communities. And, and what I have here on the right-hand side is uh, a diagram that we came up with in one of the various uh, policy efforts uh, that I've been involved with. I've done you know, some at the international and national level, but this one we actually came up with at a regional level here in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And what we have in the shape of the arrows are some of the things that we need to get to a thriving and resilient region, and then um, the circular sectors, the little colored triangles, are some of these co-benefits that we're talking about, right? So, um, so I'm only going to talk about the um, about the resilient communities, the skills, jobs, and growth um, part of this. Um, but of course, uh, there are a wider set of benefits that one cannot um, cover in the scope of a 40-minute presentation. So I, I talked about um, the costs and benefits of green industrial policy and green recovery policies. I'm going to be using these terms a little bit interchangeably. And I wanted to um, clarify what I mean um, when I'm talking about innovation, because what I will also um, um, argue is that innovation links both the costs and benefits of uh, green recoveries and green industrial policies. And when I talk about innovation, I'm not just talking about the left-hand side of this figure here, where it says research, research and development. Um, and most of the literature that is looking at innovation looks at the full innovation process, which spans from research to diffusion. And what I wanted to highlight here at the very bottom in the um, yellow rectangle is that even though innovation includes the full process all the way from when we do a lab experiment to when our technology uh, comes on the ground, um, different indicators are in the investments, patents, new products, uh, eco-innovations, cost reductions, and deployed uh, capacity, incre increased renewable energy capacity, for example. Um, we, we have different indicators to understand the different parts of the process. And we'll, I'll get back to this in a second. So uh, as you all know, uh, over the past, especially the past two decades, but even before then, since the old crisis of the 1970s, uh, countries around the world have been putting in place uh, poli policies creating market pool, demand pool policies to spur innovation, including deployment. And these include carbon pricing and beyond, but also what we have on the left hand side, and this is data from the Renewable uh, 21 report, we have about, um, since 2014 and 2019, uh, we went from around 35 countries putting in place regulatory uh, and fiscal power policies in the power sector. In the transport sector, we went from around 10 countries in 2004 to around 65 countries in uh, 2019. And we have had much less action in, um, in the heating and cooling sectors. And of course, on the right, we have the various countries and jurisdictions that have put in place um, carbon pricing and net zero targets, which Inma mentioned at the beginning. So we know there's been a lot of uh, activity in this space. 
uh, these activities have contributed to uh, improvements in technologies, to technology diffusion, um, and, and we'll talk in, in, in a little bit about, um, about this um, impact. Um, what we see in terms of the cost of a lot of the key climate mitigation technologies, and, and I have mainly focused my work in the energy sector, is that the costs have come down very quickly. This is the selection of some of the technologies um, that we have already seen. Um, we have onshore wind capital costs has come down over the past just 10 years by, by about uh, 40%. Crystalline solar PD around 80%, lithium ion batteries 89%. Uh, solid state lighting around 90 percent offshore wind um, uh, also big reductions uh, of uh, over the past um, 15 years so to some extent these um, these big improvements in technologies which have led to uh, industries both in manufacturing and in installation although on the country in some cases there's been more just on the installation side than on the manufacturing side there's been a, this new set of winners these new set of players that can lead to these co-benefits that sustain support and uh, raise ambition, policy ambition. Um, and in spite of these big improvements that we've seen in technology cost reductions, again, not in terms of emissions reductions, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do know that net zero emissions are not viable without more innovation. But here again, I'm talking about the full innovation process. I'm not just talking about a, a, a new gadget. Um, I'm talking about more deployment of what we already have. So for example, this is just a, an illustrative graph by the International Energy Agency. I'm not going to be claiming that the numbers here are uh, right. Uh, I'm, it's just a concept that I'm trying to communicate here. And what we have is that uh, we can get to uh, net zero, in this case under the International Energy Agency Sustainable Development Scenario, uh, if we increase the deployment of techno some technologies that are mature or that are in early adoption, um, but also technologies that are in the prototype phase and demonstrations. Um, so uh, one of the you know, very things that we'll talk about uh, and that research already shows is that it, uh, to get to this uh, innovation, both in the technologies that are already there to diffuse more widely and also technologies that we have in a demonstration phase, for example, is that demand for policies are essential. And this includes regulation and finance. Um, but again, also we have some technologies that are in the early stages of innovation, particularly in transport, in air transport and shipping, as well as energy intensive industries. So some of the comments I will make later are on the particular design of policies to incentivize uh, these technologies that are not yet uh, mature and the role of small and medium enterprises, because actually this is where we've uh, discovered a lot of evidence that, uh, that government policy can lead to additional outcomes. Uh, there, we, we are not seeing crowding out of uh, private sector activity in this space. So let's, let's now uh, take a minute and say, OK, well, I, we talked about the, uh, the cost of climate change mitigation, uh, of getting green technologies on the ground. And then you know, we talked about some of the possible uh, competitiveness benefits. So I'll take these two um, uh, topics in turn. So why do I start with the cost? And, and don't worry, I'm not going to start Economics 101 right now. I, I just wanted to motivate this idea of why do we care about the cost of uh, carbon mitigation technologies? Uh, we have the classic, classic uh, climate change economics question. How do you determine from a central plan the optimal amount of emissions? And there are two curves, supply and demand. And a lot of, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of uncertainty on both the marginal damages. And I'm sure many of you have followed the uh, the debate uh, you know, the North House versus Stern plus you know the subsequent research on the social cost of carbon and so forth um, and and of course a lot of that has focused on marginal damages on you know what happens with more warming to the economy to flooding to sea level rise to agriculture production and what I wanted to focus today because it's one of the areas that I've done a lot of work on is on the uncertainty around the marginal supply of abatement on the cost of mitigation so what are the costs of reducing emissions. And here, what, when you look at all of the, the various models, uh, you know, either general equilibrium models or complex integrated assessment models that look at uh, a, a more uh, granular technology detail, is that they all make assumptions, again, at different levels of granularity, uh, regarding the future costs of different technologies. In some cases, again, it's very aggregated. In some cases, you go down to the particular type of solar panel or the particular type of uh, lithium-ion battery. 
Uh, and this, again, uh, these uh, technology forecasting methods uh, are essential to design climate mitigation efforts in energy economic models, integrated assessment models, and in any really cost benefit analysis, uh, which is mandated in, in many governments, certainly in the US and in the UK. Um, also for firm investments, when firms start deciding what to invest in, in terms of both deployment or R&D or just infrastructure, they're interested in having a sense of where the different technologies are going. So it is, you know, what is going to be uh, uh, cheaper in, you know, in five years, in 10 years, for example. And uh, over time, again, these costs are, of course, by definition, unknown. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, things in the future. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, calls from environmental economists, including, you know, Bill Norhouse and many others, uh, uh, how it's important to reflect uncertainty around these costs of climate change mitigation, the marginal abatement curve. And uh, what we also see in practice, both in the policy world, in cost benefit analysis or simple uh, return on investment calculations, um, as well as in models used in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on the IPCC, as well as other uh, less granular models, is that often uh, these assumptions about future cost uh, come from two different types of methods, either expert-based methods, uh, or model-based methods. Most of the time, these uh, methods are used in a, pro in a deterministic fashion, but uh, you know, a, increasingly they are used in a probabilistic fashion. And one uh, question that, um, that I found uh, very interesting um, uh, quite a few years ago by now, that's when I started working on this particular piece, was to understand which ones perform better. And to my complete surprise, we couldn't find any literature on whether expert or model-based methods perform better in the energy space or in any other sector. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, you know, give you a sense of what we've learned during this comparison um, in the energy space. This is a paper that was just accepted in the proceedings of the U.S. National Academies of Sciences. Um, and, and what we, um, so I'll, I'll just show you what this forecast looks like in practice. This is an expert forecast for utility scale photovoltaics by the National Renewable Energy Lab in the United States. So here again, you see obviously, this forecast goes over to you know 2050. And so again, it's, you know this is what we're assuming in our models about the future. Other uh, other work, and this is a, a study in Nature Energy, used again has a kind of straight lines going forward, uh, some bands showing different forecasts. Um, but this is again a deterministic model-based forecast. So this is what, um, what I was getting at earlier, where we have these two different types of forecasts. They're used in analysis by the Commission. They're used in all kinds of in you know, the uh, in work um, supporting a solar PV subsidy in California, uh, but there was no previous work trying to determine which of these methods is better and whether or not they actually uh, predict future costs or if they are biased in one way or another. This is important because depending on if they have, uh, you know, if there are biases in these models, we can uh, underinvest in particular policies uh, or particular technologies. So again, this is a, 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 um, an article that was just accepted, will come out soon. Um, and there are different types of expert-based methods. There are expert policy, there are, um, you know, just being an expert and just putting a number in a model, uh, either again, a, a general model or, or a, you know, a, a very detailed energy economic model. Um, you have expert decisions, which are structured surveys asking about probability distribution functions. Then group methods, bringing experts together, and prediction markets using, uh, you know, prediction markets. We cover expert felicitations because they're probabilistic. They've been increasingly used in this phase, and they also don't assume that previous trajectories, technological trajectories, will continue. So they they allow for the identification of surprises, technology surprises. In terms of model-based uh, forecasting approaches, um, some of you might be familiar with Wright's Law and Moore's Law. Wright's Law was uh, pioneered by Theodore Wright in the early 20th century when he observed that costs uh, evolve as a function of cumulative production. Generally, they come down the more you do um, produce something or install something due to the process of learning by doing uh, and a lot of other things that are proxied by learning by doing. And Moore's Law is something that uh, comes from the computer world, where it was a, where um, more observed that cost came down over time. So these are the two most common methods used to forecast uh, costs. Um, there's many others, the ones at the bottom, um, but they're not nearly as widely used in any of these uh, climate uh, economic models. 
uh, we've, they've also been shown uh, just within the model-based uh, um, set of models as uh, more reliable. So what were the questions that we were trying to, um, to ask? And, and don't worry, I'll jump into the, the second part of the presentation, the competitiveness of benefits. But there's one interesting point from this uh, study that I think is very uh, relevant for policy making and for future research. So we were trying to answer the question of uh, the relative performance of expert and model-based probabilistic forecasts um, when compared with the actual observed 2019 cost. So we took forecasts that were made in 2008 and 2009, some of them by my own research group. Um, I, I was doing this back at Harvard, one of the things I was doing. How well did they predict uh, 2019 cost? And then we were comparing to each other uh, the forecast to 2030. Obviously, we don't know what 2030 costs are going to be. So this is just a comparison between two methods. And we found something that I actually thought was very interesting. So on the first question, um, uh, well, this requires getting a lot of information, collecting, harmonizing, making available data, making forecasts. And this is actually quite, you know, there are, uh, there, you know, the probabilistic methods. Uh, we use one by um, Don Farmer, who is a mathematician at Oxford. And then we uh, adapted a method developed by Greg Nemet. So we also created our own method for forecasting uncertainty. Um, so we generate forecasts using expert elicitations and four model-based approaches with two different ways of um, generating uncertainty, one including stochastic shocks, stochastic noise. Um, and then we did uh, these comparisons that I mentioned earlier for the six technologies for which this was possible in 2019 and for 10 technologies for which this was possible in 2030. We were trying to be, uh, you know, even though we collected a lot of data, we're only, you know, the comparison was only fair in, uh, for a few technologies. And the interesting thing here, and you know, here it's, it would take too long to really explain this, but what the key thing to see here is that different technologies uh, in, in bold, in black. We have nuclear electricity at the top, and then PV, electrolysis on shore wind, and so forth. Uh, the whisker plots show the forecasted probability distribution for these uh, different models. The, in black, the EE is, are the expert-based methods. And the thing that I want you to see is that, generally speaking, uh, the expert-based methods were quite bad at predicting the, uh, the actual uh, cost, uh, realized cost in 2019, which are the vertical lines in these continuous lines. So first thing, model forecasts were much more likely to include the observed value. So actually, in six out of the six technologies, the 5th to 95th percentile range captured the realized value versus one out of six in the expert uh, elicitations. That's the case of onshore wind in the top right. But the even more interesting things is that here we were looking at these probabilistic based methods. In reality, most analysis actually use a deterministic methods. So we use something like the median forecast, which is the, the vertical line in the middle of the rectangle of the whisker plot. And what you see is that with the exception of nuclear, which is always an outlier in, in, in all of these things, and of course it has its own uh, sets of uh, issues or um, 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 what we see is that in all methods, the model-based methods and the expert-based methods, the median forecast was higher than the observed value. So we have a systematic underestimation of the pace of technological chase, change. So we have, uh, you know, this cost of mitigation, the abatement cost, no matter which of these methods you use, if you use the median, which is what most uh, people uh, use, um, um, because this is not, again, not straightforward to do, um, you would be underestimating, so overestimating the cost. Uh, so we are underestimating the pace of technological change. Now, when we look at 2030, it's very similar. Uh, obviously, we can compare against realized values, but what we do see is that the expert-based methods, again, you cannot read this, but the key point is just that in the gray line, in the gray band to the right of the figures, we have the estimates from the expert elicitations, and these kind of oh, lines opening are the forecasts using the model-based methods, you do see that the ranges from the model-based methods are much wider. And also, in most cases, in most cases, except, sorry, no, except for nuclear, the, uh, the expert-based methods are more pessimistic. So we do see that expert-based methods are more pessimistic, except for nuclear, and have narrower uncertainty ranges. Again, this, uh, this is very uh, commonly done using just, okay, asking an expert here or there, you know, what the cost might be. So, so what I'm um, and I want to conclude from this section on the cost of climate change mitigation before moving on to the benefits, is that at least in energy, we see um, 
that the cost of climate mitigation are best estimated with model-based methods. They are quite uncertain, so you can, the ranges that I showed earlier with the model-based methods are quite large, but all methods underestimated technological progress and what we mentioned in this um, paper is that this is likely as a result of the stru structural changes due to policy and market drivers. So in a sense, this is good news. It may be the case that, again, previous uh, data don't predict uh, or have a, an upward bias uh, because we are finally seeing some changes in the market and in the, in the deployment and in the industrial activity and these technologies. But again, what this suggests is that the um, that uh, important decision support tools such as cost benefit analysis, such as integrated assessment models, may be overestimating mitigation costs. Okay, so now I'll move on to the benefits of, uh, of green recovery. Uh, and I, here again, I just wanted to start mentioning this Das Gupta review, and uh, of course, just with the caveat that I'm only going to be looking uh, to some extent at previous climate to tell and human capital. Uh, what we are seeing, of course, is that we're not counting, we're not measuring everything that is measuring. This is the big case that uh, Parsa Das Gupta, um, who is an emeritus here in Cambridge, uh, argued. So going back to the diagram on the innovation process, so what we do see, and I'll show you some uh, results on this, is that the evidence available shows that many decarbonization policies from procurement to research and development funding to um, options to feeding tariffs, um, portfolio standards, um, they have, generally speaking, a positive impact on the innovation process as proxied by these various indicators as at, um, at uh, um, the extent to which private R&D investment gets incentivized or, or um, increases, the extent to which there is more patenting on green technologies, new products, new industries on the ground, cost reductions, and deployment. And here I'm just going to show a few graphs from a, a recent uh, systematic review we published in Nature Climate Change um, with uh, Christina Peñasco, who uh, I don't know if she's participated in these meetings before, she's also in Cambridge now. And what we do see when we look at deployment, which is the latest kind of the indicator of the last phases of technology development, in blue, you, you know, each purple represents a particular policy instrument. And, and what you see is that the impact of deployment is generally positive, it's generally blue. There are different methods that are used to look at the impact of different policies on deployment. Again, some of these include studies that I worked on, but this includes uh, over 200 studies. Um, mainly quantitative, uh, but it also includes some uh, qualitative case studies. And on the right-hand side, we have other innovation indicators. So this is where we have the additional private R&D funding, the additional patenting, the you know new products on the on the market, and so forth. So again, what we see, generally speaking, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, is that we have a lot of blue. We see that most of the research available using a range of methods in a range of geographies actually shows a relatively consistent impact on the different innovation metrics. Now, it's a lo it looks a little bit different when you look at competitiveness impacts and distributional impacts. There's more orange, meaning that there are some short-term negative impacts um, of, of some of these uh, policies. And here, by competitiveness impacts, there are several indicators. This includes uh, exports, jobs, productivity, uh, you know, uh, firm um, size, different, uh, different metrics. In distributional impacts, it, may, uh, it includes uh, things like, uh, you know, um, disproportionate burden on vulnerable communities, higher, you know, electricity prices and this sort of thing. So the key thing from this is that, uh, you know, there's a mixture, right? So this is not all bad, it's obviously not all good, not as good as the innovation. And what we do see when we look at this and, and particular cases is that uh, it's very important to design these instruments to counter uh, or to reduce or, or uh, completely get rid of uh, some of these negative um, impacts. And again, we do see that there are ways of doing this. And again, there are some, some, um, some uh, countries have already put in place things like this. For example, in the UK, often put in place uh, you know, policies to reduce the cost of electricity, and there's been action on this in Spain too recently, of course. Um, so the picture is more, uh, depends more on the context and policy design. But again, uh, we see that there are options for getting positive competitiveness impacts from uh, these range of policies. And again, in spite of all of this empirical evidence, I showed empirical evidence about the positive impact on costs uh, earlier, about how costs are going down faster than uh, models and experts predicted. 
when we look at this kind of the same decision support tools, what we see is that a lot of these models don't include the innovation outcomes. So we know that innovation, you know, going back to the solo model model and Ron and some recent work by Philippe Aguillon and others, it's uh, really essential. And we do see that no matter what innovation outcome you look at, we see that these policies have a, a positive impact. But And yet when you look at some of the underlying models that are being used to support these decisions, they rarely include patents, additional R&D investment, new industries, new products, spillover effects across industries, which you definitely see. I have a big project funded by the Stone Foundation in New York that is looking at that. So a lot of these uh, these models, and we did a survey of uh, eight to six models, sorry, 16 models, uh, only eight included some of these outcomes, and they didn't include all of them. Uh, most models, as I said earlier, in fact, none of them uh, that we could find accounted for uh, knowledge spillovers across industries. Some of them look at, at you know, possible spillovers between doing more research or doing more deployment in solar into wind, for example, but not into other sectors. So again, models that are used to support decision making generally underestimate the economic impacts of the carbonization policies because only some positive impacts are captured, in particular on the innovation indicators, both the deployment and the other indicators, which is where we had a lot of blue, if you remember the slide with the pies. Uh, if you want to dig into this, we have a, a, a decarbonization policy evaluation tool when you can, where you can filter a little bit. There are some research gaps, certainly a lot of countries that are not covered, um, and also you can look at only quantitative evidence, for example. So now let me move on to this question of innovation. And, you know, because again, that, that, those graphs give you a very high level picture, right? We, we have a sense of a lot of positive impacts in one direction and a mixed picture in others. So if we go down a little bit, one uh, more uh, granular level, when we, I'll, I'll mention briefly two studies that we did look at, looking at uh, innovation and competitiveness impacts. Uh, induced by different types of policies in U.S. clean tech firms. This is where we were able to get the data. Uh, I would love to do this for uh, um, uh, small firms in Spain, for example. Uh, we're working in the U.K. right now. Um, so what we found is that when you look at the uh, at the um, at the set of uh, clean tech companies in the U.S., uh, we looked at all the different, you know, with the network analysis of all of their different. Um, different projects and what we found actually is that the partnerships with governments we also looked at universities we also looked at larger firms and also other small firms were associated and we we did various tests we did different matching methods and instrumental variables and various things so to the best that we could say with observational data technology-based government partnerships with startups increased pat patenting activity and follow-on financing again some of these innovation outcomes some of these competitiveness outcomes that actually lead to sustained support and increased uh, ambition. And then the other paper that I wanted to mention, the previous one is in research policy, this is in Nature Energy, was looking at ARPA. Um, ARPA is, uh, was the you know, legendary and is the legendary US funding agency for defense. And in 2009, as part of the fiscal recovery package, the US government created one for energy. And uh, in this uh, paper, we assess the impact of uh, startup funding, uh, funding from ARPA E to startup uh, US uh, startup companies. Why is it relevant? Well, the UK is actually considering creating uh, UK ARPA, they're calling it ARIA, and also the EU, uh, the EU Commission are considering adding to the portfolio of uh, research mission oriented funding bodies. So, this US ARPA E, which we analyze, connects, uh, you know, is looking at uh, different ways of distributing money. It's a research funding agency and it's supposed to be high risk, actively managed. And since 2009, the U.S. has invested $3.1 billion in this. So we now have about 10 years in data, uh, and we can say some, and, and in this paper, we look at the extent to which uh, they were doing more, uh, they had more innov innovation outcomes. And what we do see is that when you compare the ARPA-E recipients in 2010, ARPA-E 2010 here in blue, these are of the standard errors, and you compare them with, you know, a little bit like a regression discontinuity design, um, um, now this is, they did much better than those uh, ARPA E applicants that almost uh, got the ARPA E funding. And they also did much better than uh, other startup uh, companies that did not apply for ARPA E, and that other companies, the EERE, is another funding body in the US, the, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. So, overall, in terms of patenting, one innovation outcome, um, ARPA E seems to have 
uh, led to uh, additional uh, innovation uh, results. Now, interestingly, uh, ARPA-E uh, was not designed to fill the gaps, not interestingly, it wasn't designed to fill the gaps. And what we do see in this work as well, in this Nature Energy paper led by Anna Gosting, is that uh, post-award business success uh, was not much better uh, between ARPA awardees and other uh, applicants. And what this could mean is that is riskier technologies, uh, you know, that riskier technologies did as well as companies that didn't apply for this. Uh, we also compare them to the full universal startups. Um, but again, uh, they didn't do much better, suggesting again, as I was uh, saying at the beginning, that we need more market pool policies. You, this is a really great mechanism for getting new ideas further down to the innovation process, but more is needed to fill the value of death. Um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, there are many other things one can do, but overall this study combined with various others suggests that uh, this is a very promising mechanism. And this is most importantly consistent with previous research on the importance of additional uh, demonstration and pool policies, and also research on uh, how green industrial policy uh, could have important resources and funding for startups and small and medium enterprises, SMEs. So uh, these two studies that I mentioned add to the body of evidence. Uh, um, uh, there's a, a big and uh, great um, American Economic Review paper by Sabrina Howell that came out in 2017, a work by Jacqueline Pless, and they also found that especially for small firms, this additional funding for R&D, additional resources for entering markets is is uh, leading to innovation outcomes for small firms in particular. And finally, again, if I, you know, if this wasn't enough to uh, to make the case that recovery funding for small firms uh, in particular and startups in the green space is uh, leading to additional innovation and competitiveness outcomes, there was also a very recent study. Actually, it should be 2021. Um, um, by, uh, led by Cameron Hepburn, uh, covering is an expert-based study. They covered 231 uh, experts, and they found in why in these um, um, two by two metrics that is the R and D uh, clean tech R and D spending as one of the most promising uh, sources of uh, uses for fiscal recovery policies. So they also talked about infrastructure and training, uh, but one of the top ones is. Uh, clean R&D spending. But having said that, and I will finish with this kind of thought, uh, you know, we do see evidence that this uh, funding for small firms for, you know, and in other words, for training and, and green infrastructure can lead to benefits. But um, as I hinted earlier, not all countries and not all technologies are equal. This is another paper that we published last year in Nature Energy. And what we see here is that for different, we went into the global value chain for wind power, and what we saw in the vertical lines, you have different components of wind, some of them. We had um, 10 of them, I think. And we see that you're, getting, you're going from more complex, uh, so from less complex to more complex in the right. And from 2006 in the top to 2016 in the bottom. And what we do see is that for the simple components like towers, you suddenly have a lot of countries making them. When you look at gearboxes, not that many countries have caught up. So this suggests that these promises of industrial co-benefits, of competitiveness, may not be equally reaped by different countries and for different parts of the global value chain. Um, uh, there are many uh, kind of economic uh, geography, uh, manufacturing complexity, standardization, innovation system springs, investigating this. But so again, we do have a very good sense now to help us determine where the likelihood, likelihood of getting more of these competitiveness co-benefits will emerge. So, um, what are the key messages that I'm uh, hoping to uh, that you got from this uh, presentation? And again, I'm very aware of the fact that I only covered small pieces of the benefits. Um, the first one is that we need to build a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient society. And climate change and COVID um, make government actions even more urgent. Um, we need a systemic and um, purposeful policy effort that represents a step change, leveraging accumulated experience, the experience on cost reductions, the experience of co policy impact, the experience on the global value change and funding for small firms. And importantly, the current policy support tools are likely biased overestimating the cost of mitigation and the economic opportunities from innovation, which again, we know is a driver of growth. Green industrial policy, well designed, and with the most vulnerable at the center. Again, we do see that when things are not, uh, you know, designed to account for this, you can get uh, negative distributional impacts on the most vulnerable communities. 
Uh, this can help build support and advance multiple societal goals. And I, I touched a couple of uh, upon a couple of things, components of these green recovery policies. I talked about so resources to support innovation startups and small and medium-sized firms. We have more evidence on the additionality of these types of mechanisms. Um, increased uh, mission-oriented R&D investments and using different funding mechanisms. And again, based on that survey of experts, but also other work, we know that new skills training, green infrastructure financing, and additional fiscal and regulatory policies, again, and well designed can help realize some of these benefits and tackle the climate um, challenge. And finally, again, these green industrial policies need to consider differences across technologies and domestic capacity to help prioritize and manage expectations about outcomes as well as provide long, a long term framework addressing the full innovation system. You know, just like in the case of our PAE, we saw, well, we got technologies much further, but if you really want a higher proportion of firms making it, more demand pool is needed. So I, I could give you many examples of this. Uh, and just one thing to say before I conclude, obviously these points about uh, mission-oriented R&D investments are not as applicable to or as crucial to uh, developing countries, so at least we don't have as much evidence on this. I was trying to focus my comments on you know, Europe and you know, uh, industrialist countries. And finally, just to conclude, uh, thank you for your attention again for uh, inviting me uh, to join you today and to my very wonderful uh, co-authors, some of whom are in this um, website as well as the uh, many sources of funding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura, for your excellent presentation and uh, very, very informative. I, I would uh, I would have I would like to ask the public to write uh, the questions in the chat or to raise your hand if you have any questions. And um, I would like to start and open the floor maybe with uh, with a question that uh, is uh, well since you started the presentation I was uh, thinking in the background about Mariana Matsukato and Mission Economics because it reminds me what what uh, your, the core of your idea reminds me um, quite a lot the, the main uh, message of her book that I think also exits in Spain or is yes is I think on the 20th of, of May and um, I think uh, you share with her also the idea of, of course, innovation is, is crucial, is very important, and it has to be done together, governments, firms, even the public or the affected, uh, I don't know, citizens, everybody has to be involved in this mission. And uh, the economy uh, can be also, or some directions can be, uh, given to the economy by the government, and uh, we are a bit, uh, well, going back to other idea, not to free market, but also to, to emphasize the role of governments. So my first question is if you see a parallel there, and my second one is concerning the recovery funds and the Spanish plan, how to use the funds, if you could also elaborate a bit on this, what is your opinion on that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Matilda. Yes, of course, I, I know very well Mariana's work, and I, I, I cite her heavily in all of these papers that I've mentioned. <laughs> so your, you know, your identification of the, and actually, usually my presentations we have it, but I was trying to, uh, you know, to put too many things. So I, maybe I had to get rid of some of the more framing slides, so they you know the role of government. But absolutely, I think the crucial role of innovation and the role of governments uh, as, uh, uh, you know creating and shaping markets, which, you know, shaping markets is the language that Mariana Matsukato uses, uh, is something that we absolutely share. What I was trying to present here, I, I think, is kind of going down one uh, level down, you know, when we think about, okay, when, when one looks at, even if one looks at cost-benefit analysis, which is, again, unless it gets changed, and maybe it should get changed, given that it's very hard to monetize all of these benefits that, that I mentioned, um, the tools that we have to make these decisions uh, are reflecting these, you know, more expensive technologies and are not reflecting a lot of these benefits that, again, through Mariana's work and through some of these kind of program level or, you know, policy evaluation work that I've presented are not reflecting. So, I, so absolutely, I, um, I also, I agree also with the comment you made about 
the role that different actors play. I haven't played, I haven't done as much work on the role of the public. So I've done a lot of work on these public private partnerships, as you pointed out. Um, absolutely. Um, on the uh, on the Spanish uh, um, plans, again, I you know I haven't looked at them in a lot of detail. I know they're still being worked out, right? So I think there are a couple of, of, of things that um, uh, that uh, I, I would call attention to the especially good evidence that we have on the additional impact of some of these R and D efforts, you know, incubators. Um, grants for small and medium firms. I think that is a, the one thing that, uh, again, I, I don't know what fraction of the total funding is currently being going, going to those players versus large players, uh, but I do think that the combination, there's been four or five, in my view, really good studies looking at different programs. In some cases, it's expertise. In some cases, it's R&D funding. In some cases, it's a connection. Um, uh, that there is one area where I think there's a lot of promise. Um, uh, for example, I know less of uh, work looking at assessing specific training programs. I think this is essential, but I, I wouldn't, you know, maybe others in the conference are, are working on this, but for example, I wouldn't be able to comment on that because I haven't done as much work on that area. Thank you very much. There is a question by Jose Garcia Quevedo. Jose, do you want to uh, open your mic or shall I read the question? Or well, as you want, I can, I can make the question. Uh, yes, Hi, Laura. I am Jose Garcia Quevedo. Hi. Uh, my question is about the speed of these policies. No, I think that an important issue to face climate change is, is the speed, and I would like to know if you think the speed of the current policies is adequate or how to increase them or this speed if necessary. Yes, it's a very, very difficult question. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of work uh, on this topic in the US uh, because I know that system the best. I was there for almost nine years. Uh, and, you know, while we were able to kind of calculate, okay, what, you know, looking at all of these uncertainties, how much more R&D should we invest, how much more deployment should we have to, uh, to um, accelerate or um, uh, enable learning by doing, there's this question of, uh, you know, if you go too quickly, uh, there's, you know, great work by David Otter and others on the, you know, doubling of the health NIH funding in the U.S., uh, that shows that if you do this too quickly, then you increase the salaries, the wages of researchers, and you end up being not very efficient, right? So there's a balance to be struck between the urgency of, on climate and um, and um, using funding uh, correctly. So the, some of these things are not as hard to ramp up, but of course, one shouldn't go from zero to, let's say, we're in the case of Spain, going to suddenly zero to a billion of you know an ARPA Spain for example might not be very wise because it would take a while to learn that at least in the US they could learn from the DARPA so I know this is a, a characterization I'm not saying that this is happening but I, I think it's a difficult balance on the, and depending on the particular part of the green recovery some things because of previous experience uh, and because of uh, you know the issue can be done faster than others some of them will have to be adaptable and flexible that's a difficult question. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Irina. Thank you for the presentation. It has been very nice. Very good. Are there any further questions? I don't see any um, written question in the chat, but if anybody wants to step in and ask a question, otherwise I will ask a second one. <laughs> OK, then. Um, I wanted to ask you about the zero net, the net zero targets that many countries have announced, many of them for 2050, others even before the UK uh, or even Bhutan, I think it's, it's already <laughs> below zero. So they are, it's very interesting to see the speed and this domino effect in which one started and the rest uh, will follow and started to announce all these zero uh, net zero targets. What is your opinion on this? Do you think this is feasible? And uh, what is your opinion, given that you are an expert? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so clearly uh, the uh, targets by themselves without the policies to meet the targets, uh, you know, are, you know, are not uh, going to do much. Uh, luckily now we have, you know, there's the NDCs. Now hopefully there will be some increased ambition in the in the actual policies to uh, meet the goals. It's 
clearly really very difficult to turn the tide so quickly. Just if we look at the very first slide, I'm saying centered is very hard. But again, we've been surprised in terms of the pace of change in a lot of these technologies that I talked about. And we are seeing some structural changes, more businesses. There's more, there's more of a momentum. So what we're seeing, you know, now is two thirds of the emissions in the world are covered by these targets. A range of, uh, you know, jurisdictions, you know, the EU, EU continue, you know, is one of the leading ones, of course, uh, putting in place a lot of very serious policies. I think it's very, very difficult, but uh, there's there's a, a growing change in how this is being seen. Uh, when you look at uh, back, you know, the 2009 Copenhagen, uh, the climate was seen as a burden. Now it's you know, since 2015, but more so recently, it's more seen as an opportunity by some countries. I'm not claiming everybody's doing this. If you, you know, talk with China, and I do a lot of work in China and with Chinese um, faculty members and, and, and students and, and so forth, uh, you do see that they see it totally as an opportunity. They do, the, they, they have this green industrial policy framing, a little bit of health code benefits because, of course, air pollution is an issue. I think we'll, it will um, see more of this. Uh, but it's of course a massive, massive challenge. So we, we do need these net zero targets to be accompanied by much more aggressive, by a fundamental change in the policy and regulatory framework of the different countries. Otherwise, they will not be met. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I think it's very nice to finish this talk with a very optimistic view. I think your view <laughs> is optimistic. I am also optimistic with the new technologies. And I think I am more towards this Porter hypothesis that maybe new regulations, if they are put in place, they, they will also speed innovation in green technologies. And hopefully we will meet, if not uh, the, the targets, we will be near the targets. And uh, if there are no further questions, I think it's already one o'clock. So thank you very much again for your excellent presentation. I think we are all going to be inspired by, by your talk. And uh, it was very, very nice that you could uh, finally accept the invitation. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Bye bye. Bye bye. A pleasure. Bye. I don't know if Jordi, you, you have to say anything or just I close the session? Uh, yeah, I don't know how to close. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Oh, no, no, Hello, I'm Laura. Laura. I'm Francisco Requena, the person in charge of the organization. So thank you very much for. Uh, your speech and don't worry you can leave the room wherever you want okay <laughs> thank you and nice to meet okay. you uh, Ima. thank you very much <laughs> for good questions bye thank you laura thank you Ima. Bye.